Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. For, well, it's now good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, those of you with us here, media, others online on our streams. And um, this morning, I'm accompanied by two very senior medical doctors, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh and Dr. Lakram Bodo, uh, both very skilled and experienced in their field. They're both ONG persons, um, so very fitting from their experience to help us understand this horror, this horrendous issue uh, plaguing our public health system. Of course, uh, we are talking about the ongoing media reports of the heartbreaking, traumatizing deaths of 11 newborn babies thus far at the Portsmouth General Hospital, the NC, the neonatal intensive care unit. For the past week, our nation has been traumatized, horrified, and truly left baffled, baffled as day by day more and more parents emerge in the public domain, confirming that their newborn babies have died in this crisis. You know, I'm a mother, a grandmother, aunt, friend, godmother. This is amongst the most heartbreaking crisis and a set of incidents that I've ever witnessed in my over 40 years of politics in TNT, indeed in my lifetime. Our fathers are also not spared from this tragedy because the death of an infant baby is something that leaves us all with a hollowness in our hearts. Children have long been the light of this world. Babies give us the hope as parents to keep on living. Parenthood gives us purpose, hope, and joy that nothing else can bring to the human heart, the human mind, the human soul. I can never express how much pain and how it breaks my heart when I think of those poor parents. So we cannot, as a responsible opposition, remain silent on this very crucial issue. We are here today, together with my colleagues, to give our official assessment of this outrageous national crisis. We see this as a tragedy and travesty of unparalleled proportions. So we are here today to call on Dr. Rowley and his government to take immediate action to address this unimaginable crisis. And the way that they can do that is to open the Coover Children's Hospital immediately. It was reported in media last week. Seven babies at the NICU at Port of Spain General died from neonatal sepsis between April 4 and April 7, 2024. By this week, that number is climbed to 11 neonates, 11 babies. We don't know how many more babies have died as a result of this, and maybe in the coming days, God help us, no more shall be revealed. But even so, one baby's life is too much. I say this with a fear of contradiction, that this lies solely in the hands of Prime Minister Rowley's government, which has an utterly failed and incompetent, destructive government. We are now seeing the most incomprehensible, unimaginable tragedy unfold, innocent newborn babies, the deaths of them. It is bad enough to have citizens living under an unprecedented crime and violence wave that has seen the demonic deaths of our children and babies over the years. But now, to have our newborn babies die in the very place where their mothers went to give birth, that is indeed a blight on our nation. It is a sign of a cursed government from hell. I noticed the Prime Minister is back from his luxurious European vacation, saying we should not politicize this. I will address that comprehensively shortly, but I will say this. This is not a politicization of the tragedy. We have outlined all the problems over the years. We have been saying for years that the hospitals under this government have become virtual killing fields, where people go in fairly healthy, strong. They go in for a simple procedure and they come out as a corpse. We have been asking the Prime Minister for years to fire his coolest health minister. Of course, as usual, he refuses to even give credence to the problems being faced in the health sector. When we look at the true horror we have faced in the past week, the government now stands guilty of overseeing the mass deaths of 11 newborn babies. And as I said, we pray God not anymore. What did our country and citizens do to deserve this government from hell? This situation could have been avoided. Members of the media as of now, we are witnessing parents coming out every day nearly under legal advice. 
I will not get into the details of that aspect because senior lawyers know that we do not comment at all on matters under legal review and which may end up in our courthouse. I will comment that this incident happened and the relevant health authorities never raised it, not the Minister of Health or anyone else from the relevant authorities. It was kept a secret and hidden until the media, we say locally we say, bust the mark. It was the media last week who came out and exposed this. An express article on Sunday, April 15, 2024 notes, and I quote, it is clear that these deaths were quietly swept under the carpet by the Ministry of Health, the Northwest and the Northwest Regional Health Authority. For that expose, in the Trinidad Express and on the TV6 News, the public would never have known about these serious incidents. That itself has, to my knowledge, not been, been denied by the health minister. I am saying that it is evidence of neglect and negligence at the highest levels of the health ministry. Why, when something so dangerous, indeed fatal to our babies and, and citizens, began occurring, did the Minister of Health not make this public and take immediate corrective action? When one baby died, cause for concern and alarm, nothing raised. You wait till two, three, four, five, six, seven after, and it only became public because of that Express newspaper article on Sunday. When something so dangerous happened, I said again, the Minister and the Ministry of Health would should have made it public and should have taken immediate corrective action. They would have been informed from the outset. This is a maternity hospital we are talking about, serving hundreds of thousands of patients in the Northwest region. People give birth there every day. It is not something that could be avoided. It is not something that could not have been avoided. Why was this not made public and patients advised to go to other hospitals? This alone suggests tangible proof of an attempted cover-up. It is not only irresponsible, but could have led to the deaths of more babies. So I want to commend the media and the journalists for their investigative work and exposing this issue so thoroughly and continuing to do so. When I said that as a mother I was heartbroken, that is really an understatement. And not just mothers, as I said, fathers here, aunts, uncles, grandparents, every person is traumatized. Babies are a joy to an entire family. Everyone looks forward to a newborn baby in a family. What is even more heartbreaking is the pain and suffering of these parents of these babies. If we look at newspaper headlines express again, Thursday, April 18th, just yesterday, uh, April 18, 2024. Two sets of twins die. Two sets of parents lost twins. Two sets of families lost not one but two babies each in this debacle, this fiasco, this scandal. Mothers and families are now enduring emotional and mental trauma as a result. Let's look at the Guardian headline on Thursday, April 18, yesterday, 2024. Mother of NICU baby struggles to get out of bed after the death of the baby. The article says, and I quote, during an emotional interview with Guardian Media yesterday, 21-year-old Danielle Samaru said the death of her baby is so overwhelming, she finds it hard to even get out of bed most days. The article continues, I keep quoting, every day is getting progressively worse for me. Just the thought of her not being there, not being around, it has been challenging and overwhelming. It is hard to make it out of bed some days. We have her blanket that she would have left in the NICU. With, I have it with, and I sleep with it. Every night, it is so hard to let go of things, she said as she wept in that Guardian article. End of quote there. Further, we now have a situation where expectant mothers and parents are traumatized at the thought of delivering their babies at that hospital. The Guardian headline again yesterday, Thursday, April 18, 2024. Expectant moms at Port Spain General Hospital. I can't afford to lose my child and take that easy. Guardian yesterday. Now the depression and the suffering of these families derail these parents' lives and destroy families. Today I am calling on the Minister of Health 
to immediately provide free and professional psychological, psychological counseling for these affected parents. They need counseling. Also, they must provide immediate monetary compensation for any work lost or losses that these traumatized families have suffered in the immediate and, of course, in the short term. It is the least the government can do for them at this time. Let's talk about the probe being proposed. What is even more appalling but not surprising is the response of Prime Minister Rowley. I note he's promising an immediate investigation into this national tragedy and scandal. He has also promised uh, uh, PAHO will do an independent probe. We all know that this is just another puppy show. Every time something happens in this country, you set up a probe, you set up a commission, you do an inquiry, and then what happens? We never see the reports. There's so many. We remember the roadmap to recovery, the paria diving issue, the deaths of those divers. So yes, okay, nothing is done after. We all know that even if this probe is done, report handed in, they will refuse to do anything about it when we look at their track record. Remember in the COVID times, I mean, really dangerous times for us, there was a Simonga report, the 2022 Simonga report into the COVID mismanagement. To date, that report is still collecting dust while patients continue to die from COVID up to this day. Even the Nursing Association recognized this is just another sham probe call in yesterday's Express. A Guardian report yesterday states, and I quote, the PM trained his guns on healthcare workers who did not take their jobs seriously. Typical Prime Minister Rowley. Blame game. Always blaming everybody else except him and his officials and the persons he appointed to be in charge of these matters. The Prime Minister also chastised those who attempted to politicize the tragedy. Amid calls from the UNC for the Minister of Health, Terence E. Singh, to be fired. This matter was first raised in a press conference by us from Dr. Bodo when he had made that call then. So they believe that when we speak about this issue, we are being political about it. Nothing is further from the truth. We have first Prime Minister Rowley's expected blame blame on the healthcare workers. And as I say, no one is surprised. This is a trademark admission of failure, blaming everyone when they fall down on the job, when he and his team are the ones falling down on the job. Shameless, unconscionable. Rowley's attack on the UNC for political statements, but in response to Prime Minister Rowley's comments about the so-called politicization of the issue, I want to say this today. Your health minister was appointed by you. The boards and managers of the RHAs, they also ultimately have been appointed by you, and they are the ones who are responsible for this national tragedy. they are state employees appointed by you. Remember that all these RHA boards, your minister of health, they have been handpicked and appointed by you, so don't come to blame the ordinary nurses on the job in the hospitals. They are paid by taxpayers' dollars to do an independent job in the best public interest, which is literally a matter of life or death of citizens. All public sector employees are legally and constitutionally accountable to the public they serve. The Rowley government especially since their decisions are costing citizens their lives. Own up. You're costing newborn babies their lives. When people are paid by taxpayers to do an independent job, in the public interest, they must be held accountable. So what I'm saying, when me or any other member of the opposition, when we call on the government to account for what their failed, dismal, deadly, incompetent performances in these jobs, because newborn babies are dying in our hospitals, and it's, a, it's an attack on them, and there's nothing short of typical PNM lies propaganda and gaslighting. The opposition UNC has a constitutional duty to represent interests, safety, welfare, and rights of all citizens. When 11 newborn babes lost their lives due to a failing health system, it is the duty of the loyal opposition of this country to speak up and to draw these matters to the attention of the public. We can look at their failure, deadly failure, in the health sector. News the article yesterday again, and I quote from it, quotes PM Rowley as saying, health has always been a priority for this government. What a laughable statement. 
health has always been a priority for this government. They tell us we have the best health care in the world, but every time one of them falls sick, where do they do? What do they do? They travel abroad. They go abroad. Prime Minister Rowley had told us he had to go on his vacation, and sometime thereafter he'll be going for his medical checkup. So what's wrong with the doctors here? So you both you have this great health system, as I say, laughable, and as usual, the hypocrisy of this government. The fact is that over the past eight years of the Rowley regime, and the Minister of Death, Terence Lial Singh, their disastrous reign as in this uh, looking after our health care, citizens have been entering hospitals, as I said before, as patients, they come out dead, corpses, because of the improper and inadequate health care they serve, they receive. Many families have had to suffer the immense pain of losing loved ones in the very place that is supposed to cure them. That, this is not only heartbreaking, but frankly it is inhumane. Every year their budgets are consistently filled with failed and rehashed promises of yesteryear. No tangible measures to improve the quality of health care. The facts indicate this is the worst health care system in decades. For the past eight years, almost going on nine years with this administration, our nation's hospital, especially at San Fernando, Mount Hope, Port of Spain, which service hundreds of thousands of citizens, have been turned into virtual killing fields. Why? There is a chronic lack of medication. Why? There are shortages of CDAP medical items severely affecting the elderly. Insufficient nursing and senior medical staff remember they shut down that nursing academy we had built somewhere to train our nurses, right in El Dorado. I remember going there opening it. All our young people being trained for jobs in the medical field. They shut it down. I don't know what, I think it's just closed now. I asked Sam um, Khadija and her team to visit at El Dorado area and it's just shut down. No care for training. Shortages of surgical supplies. Lack of operating theater time and space for surgeries. Severe overcrowding at the accident and emergency departments. I am told often up to 60 critically ill patients are hoarded like animals in a pen, waiting for a bed in a ward, sometimes for up to three days. Many die on chairs, trolleys, or on the floor while waiting urgent medical care and attention. It is a national horror story, our healthcare system. Outrageous and even criminal for a public health sector receives massive amounts of money, a huge chunk of taxpayers' money in the budget every year, you know. Approximately seven billion dollars every year since twenty sixteen, which totals if we counted eight years and means what? Fifty six billion dollars in our healthcare system in the last eight years. So what led to this tragedy that we're talking about? this horrific national crisis. Now I have here with me, as I said, two very senior doctors, experienced gynecologists and medical doctors in Trinidad, Dr. Gopi Singh, Dr. Bodo. They have informed me of the following issues which would have possibly avoided this horrific national tragedy of 11 babies. One, each RHA, which has a neonatal intensive care unit, must have a protocol manual easily available for all staff and personnel to adhere to. Did this happen? Did they? Protocol detection, isolation, and sanitation, and the vigil. As soon as a baby gets sick, they must be isolated. The baby must be isolated. Sanitization and cleaning must be done by trained personnel in the neonatal sanitation. There ought to be a number of seminars conducted for the staff, NICU staff, and personnel, and these should include training to detect early infection. You don't wait till seven there and it moves up to the 11 and we don't know how many more. There must be a fully trained infection control nurse for every NICU. That nurse must be in control of swabbing, culture, sensitivity, testing, cleaning, there must be strict adherence to the protocols established in the protocol manual. There must be protocol manuals in every one of the NICU uh, formulated by senior medical personnel over a period of time. They must be using as well WHO protocol guidelines. There must be adequate antiseptic cleaning solutions for cleaning of that of tubings, ventilators, all equipment in the NICU. 
Now, we've heard over and over again of a lack of supplies, a lack of equipment in all our institutions. In addition, there must be proper surveillance for early detection. There must be adequate staffing, nurses and doctors for NICU per neonate. There must be an adverse event, algorithm, and reporting system in a timely and caring manner. Don't wait till seven people die, babies die. The resident staff must detect if there is a trend in emerging infections and what could be contributing to this trend. So when one baby died, okay, radar went up, eyes open wide. When it hits two and then three, I mean, what happened? Nothing happened until the express expose, nothing happened. So in essence, it is prevention, early detection, surveillance, sanitation, supplies of antibiotics and staff to the neonate ratio. Therefore, this is a case of acute surveillance and management by the RHA to provide adequate nurses to neonate ration. I'm sorry, <laughs> ratio, an adequate ratio per neonate, infection control nurse, doctor to neonate ratio, adequate supplies for cleaning and for treatment of infection, isolation areas in the NICU and adequate spacing of neonates while they are being managed, adherence to strict protocols of protocol manuals, and all of this is the responsibility of the board and management of the RHEs, chief operation officer, chief executive officer, a medical chief of staff, a nurse in charge. Such a situation would have been caused by a lack of intense management because this is critical in areas like these for saving lives. I mentioned already, already the closure of the El Dorado Nursing School that contributed to this tragedy. Neonatal mortality decreased significantly under the government island. NICU is a resource intensive area and we had more NICU facilities in the Coover Children's Hospital, showing our commitment to this very, very vital era. So today we call for the immediate firing of the Minister of Death, Terence Yassi, the immediate firing of the entire board CEO and CMOH of the Port of Spain General Hospital, CEO and Chief Medical Officer of that institution. Why? Because they sat down and new babies were dying at a higher rate than usual and did absolutely nothing to prevent the other seven or eight or nine babies dying from infection. That is unpardonable and points to serious, possibly criminal negligence. An urgent statement from the health minister as to what precautionary measures are now being implemented to prevent a recurrence of this widespread infection which caused the death of these babies. What have you done? What have you put in place to, to avoid such a horror occurring again? We want to know whether there was adherence to the protocols in the NICU. And were they followed or were they ever used in the first place when the staff realized infections were coming down? We call for information regarding the medical and equipment supplies in an NICU. We want to know whether there has been isolation errors within the unit to prevent infected babies from infecting the other babies. Is there adequate medical and nursing professional staff and neonatal us. How you pronounce this up? <laughs> those who look, doctors who look after the neonates. <laughs> we must have those professional staff to prevent a recurrence of this. How does this compare to international best practice standards? Whether there has been adequate sterilization and cleaning in the NICU now. Whether there's enough supply and equipment to be used in the management of the preterm neonates. We want an immediate investigation. Look, we bring in power, fine. But why don't we use local experts, because we have them, into this so the corrective measures can be taken and from the information gathered, we can take steps to prevent a recurrence of this. Now, I am told that get power involved, which is a very good thing to do, that it will take a long time and then protocol will have, protocols will have to be established and so on. So that at the end of the day, that report may come so late. I mean, even with the paria dry divers up to today, you have a report, nothing being done about. So you must tell the country whether they have done any cleansing and sanitation. No. Uh, is it ongoing with expectant mothers? 
We call for urgent report from the chief medical officer of the hospital and CEO of the RHA and ask what protocols they are now doing to establish, as I say, to prevent a recurrence because mothers are delivering babies at that hospital. The Minister of Health must tell the country whether now there is a necessity for closing down that unit, that NICU in uh, Bordesby, at the Bordesby Hospital. Now I come to the crux of the issue and what could have prevented this absolute horrendous nightmare, worse than a nightmare. It is a fact that by his deliberate, malicious, vindictive, dangerous and now deadly refusal to open the Kuva Children's Hospital, which was built by the government I led, we are now seeing a situation where the health sector has been transformed into a place of horror where newborn babies are dying. The Kuva Hospital, the Kuva Hospital, that fiasco will remain forever a testament to this government's malicious, vicious, anti-people nature, a symbol of the destruction of our nation. When I became Prime Minister in 2010, a major challenge was to fix the seriously failing health sector, under which mothers would die, often in childbirth, and that was something I know Dr. Bodo worked very strongly on um, with the Southwest Regional Health Authority, our then Minister of Health, Dr. Khan, and that hospital in Kuva was a tool, an instrument to my administration's health sector reform. It was a state-of-the-art institution, it still is, strategically located to buffer overcrowding at both San Fernando and Mount Hope hospitals. It was supposed to specialize in medical care for children and house a much-needed burns unit for Central Trinidad. As you know, we have the points research development, so we, it, it does have the burns unit there that access could be had to from any industrial accidents in Point Lisa's. That hospital would have created hundreds of jobs for healthcare and other professionals. And ultimately, the plan was to open that hospital for medical tourism. We would have had state-of-the-art hospital right here in TNT, and others from the Caribbean region, the CARICOM, they could access that healthcare here in Trinidad. So, that was a, a, an engine driver on its own. It was a great uh, innovation for the health sector, but would also, as I said, created jobs and brought in forex through the medical tourism. And let's just say eight years later on, none of that has happened. Absolutely none of that has happened. Since 2018, the failed Rowley government has blatantly refused to open it because of sheer envy and vindictiveness. Initially, the Minister of Death, the Alcing, claimed there were insufficient doctors to open a hospital. That is totally not true. They lied. To date, I am told there are over 300 young qualified local doctors and there are also hundreds of nurses who are still waiting on jobs. So that was then, in 2015 as well, Prime Minister Rowley appointed the infamous Welsh Committee and said he was waiting on them to give recommendations on what to do with the Cuba Children's Hospital. That report is still gathering dust on some shelf somewhere in his office. That Welsh report took two years to be completed. And as I say, it's collecting dust on some shelf in somebody's office. That report recommended that the government get a partner to co-operate the hospital. But the government couldn't get a partner. Indeed, why? No one wants to work with this corrupt, inc incompetent, rowley government. Four years later, moving along, moving along, Minister Dial Singh in 2019 came out to say that an offshore medical school be facilitated there and that UWI had a 51% share in the Scuba Hospital. We look at um, an article in the Trinidad Express. Uh, I'll give you the date in a moment here, but this article talked about no longer the Children's Hospital. So they changed the name. They've changed the name and arose by any other name. It still arose. It's just a name change. I said there's another name change. Maybe you'll ask me about it and then I'll give you my comments on that other name change. So eight years later, there is no offshore medical school. No offshore medical school. Um, that express article, I believe, was in uh, May, May 16, 2019. Now eight years later, no offshore medical school. No medical school. It was during the COVID-19 pandemic when they killed over 4,000 citizens with, mis with mismanagement, 
that they actually opened the COVID Children's Hospital to do what? COVID. It took a pandemic to open that state-of-the-art hospital, which is still there standing. And I wonder if you recall when we were building that, when we started the building, they said it was an earthquake zone. Well, up to today, how many years later, it's still standing firm and strong. We did laser with the Geotechnical Society. Yeah. Okay, Ms. John is reminding me, we did laser with the geotech people and when we were designing it, so that uh, earthquake risk, you know. It, it also, <laughs> earthquakes came, earthquakes, several came and went and it is still standing this strong. It reminds me, you know, when we um, opened the Bish High School, because it was built on a Mr. Pandey's watch, they refused to open it. They said all kinds of things would happen. Children would get sick, it, you know, it's always these lies. Refuse, the children suffered here years. Fortunately, God is great. We returned to government, and I was able to go and open that Bisha school up to the non one child. Not one child has been adversely affected by anything coming in or out or from around the school. So during that pandemic, they opened Coover for the treatment of COVID. For five years, from 2015 to 2020, this disastrous, vicious, hateful, rowdy government left a modern $2 billion institution with hundreds of millions of proper medical equipment, which they're leaving it there to deteriorate from lack of use. And you know why? Just because it was the government I led who built the school. Do you know how many lives we could have saved over the past eight years? Do you know how many lives could have been saved if we had opened that hospital? Pure malice and spite, true Rowley p &M style. And who suffers at the end of the day? Innocent citizens who die. Certainly not Mr. Rowley or his cabinet ministers, as I told you before, who spend time, taxpayers' dollars, uh, for health care expenses and so on outside of the country. How can anybody in this deadly Rowley government claim to have a conscience of humanity? They should all hang their heads in shame. They did the same, as I said, with the Bish High School in 2001. Then we built that school. They had a commission of inquiry into it, which showed we did nothing wrong. And for 10 years, the people and the children on beach suffered long distances they had to drive to get to school for 10 years. As I say, God is great, and we returned to open it, and it is still standing today. So, um, Kevin is giving me, we can play the video on the TV next to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not ready for that video yet. Please, thank you. Coming back to the hospital, I know you're anxious for us to remember what that hospital looks like. It was such such a wonderful state-of-the-art place. You know, I talked about the benefits of that hospital for health care for our citizens, but also for providing jobs and also for medical tourism to get forex. Those are three aspects of it. You know something else? I had set up the Children's Life Fund, yeah? The children who had... Could not access health care for that particular type of disease that they had, but would die from it. That they could get this funding, Children's Life Fund, and go abroad. But this Children's Hospital, that was part of that plan too. That those who we couldn't have the, the particular uh, diseases or illnesses or whatever, me, this Children's Hospital, state of the art, would have been, we didn't have to send them abroad. And we could have saved that foreign exchange money. You see, when you're too short sighted, really, is everybody else has to pay because of their. their spite and vindictiveness. This government, baby-killing government, they tried for years to demonize that ground-breaking children's hospital. I recall when we turned the south for the hospital on March 2, 2012. I said it was one of the most important events of my public life. I said that hospital was a cherished dream for me for a long time, very close to my heart. I stated then, and I quote, because the words are worth remembering, we are not about erecting white elephants willy-nilly. We are not about creating edifices of political egos, monuments of pretentious aggrandizement at the expense of ignoring the plight of the people. We are carefully planning the development of Trinidad and Tobago that encompasses the entire country, north, south, east and west, urban and rural, and we are about being people-centered. I then said, every child that passes through this facility in the years to come, for every medical professional who is trained here and gains employment here, for every hurt, soothed person, for every parent who doesn't have to suffer the pain of being unable to afford urgent medical care for their child, 
for so many wonderful, heartwarming moments and reasons, we were building the hospital for all these reasons. Senator Gillian John is here with me today. And she was very instrumental as then the head of Unicot because they were given the responsibility to build this hospital. She can attest today, as can both doctors here, Dr. Gopi Singh and Dr. Bodo, who were both in the cabinet I led, they can both attest that the Kuva Children's Hospital Initiative was being achieved using the guidance and technical expertise made available to us from the government of the Republic of China. Neonatal Intensive Care at Kuva Hospital. I think Kevin wants to show his video now so we can see it. So, a picture is worth a thousand words, Kevin. Not yet, no, no, it's at the end. It's at the end. This is a neonatal intensive care unit. This is where, at the Cooper Children's Hospital, we will offer care for our nation's most vulnerable. What you see here is a neonatal incubator. This offers a cocoon like environment with optimal cellular regulation and protection from internal factors. So that is the hospital we built and we left. Um, Dr. Boris said maybe gathering cobwebs, I don't know. Yeah. Building this hospital now, that's what we should do. They should open this hospital. When you see the equipment, when you see what is there, we can save so many lives, we can save so many, many lives. Open the hospital. Now, you would have seen parts of it there, but can I just share with you? There are 12 dedicated incubators. Each incubator was equipped with specialized light, temperature, humidity, monitoring, and oxygen, oxygen sensors for monitoring. They are dedicated vital signs monitors. They are blood pressure monitors. There are neonatal resuscitation equipment. Neonatal, remember, is the young babies, newborn. Fully equipped resuscitation trolleys. Portable analyzers. Dedicated health boards with oxygen and suction emergency calls are linked directly to the nursing station. They have inbuilt, they have built in audible and signal light alarms and dedicated electrical outlets for additional critical care equipment. 
They have dedicated hygiene and infection control areas. There are two dedicated nursery areas where only the staff can be there with the children in the nursery. There are 24 infant bassinets designed with infection control in each. Each bassinet is self-contained and easy to clean with its own storage unit built in. And this is to ensure there would be no cross-contamination between infants and others in infection control. Central nurses statement station with monitoring, view large viewing windows into the nurseries, dedicated family area with access to hygiene facilities, prevention and infection control thereby, dedicated area for feeding and infant care, where nurses can counsel, teach and demonstrate safe care practices to new mothers, mother and child only. I want us to know that this hospital was designed and approved with the intention to deliver world-class health care to people here in our country. It was designed with clinicians, staff, and end users in mind for ease of use and functionality. This was done with proper planning and understanding of patient flows within the facility. This design ensured that the facility could function with maximum or minimum staffing without compromising patient care or the medical service being provided. This was done through the advanced state-of-the-art medical, surgical, plant and equipment bought and installed in that facility. I can give you an equipment overview very quickly. Cricketer care beds, 8. Child cots, 48. Infant bassinets, 24. Neonatal incubators, 12. Patient treatment trolleys, 34. Specialized headboards, 80. Wall-mounted diagnostic sets, 40. Specialized medical and surgical equipment, vital sign monitors, 30. Neonatal child ventilators, 12. I wonder if you even thought of checking those ventilators there, the neonatal equipment. And when this started to happen in Port of Spain, to bring in that equipment, or is it all stolen and lost by now? All these things were sitting there that could have helped us with this crisis that we faced recently. Twelve neonatal child ventilators, syringe pumps, eight, portable analyzers, 12, examination lights, 35, fully equipped crash carts, 12, fully equipped neonatal resuscitation units, six, oxygen sensors and monitoring systems, advanced audible and virtual emergency alarm systems for quick ID of health emergencies. This is just a short listing of the equipment provided to the Cuba Children's Hospital. It does not include all the surgical and plant equipment. I concentrated more on that affecting the issue that is with us. The above medical equipment list is available at the hospital and it consists of major and minor life-saving equipment. It should be noted that the death due to an illness is a possibility. That can always happen, but they can also be prevented. And the risk can be minimized if we have the right medical and diagnostic equipment, and that is provided to trained clinicians and medical staff. That hospital was designed and built with patient care as its priority. This can be seen in the design of the wards with patient and clinical flow areas clearly marked as clean corridors and dirty corridors. There's also access to hygiene stations throughout the wards. This was done for infection control and to minimize contamination from within and outside the wards to protect patients, but to protect the healthcare staff and the general public at all times. The advanced audible and visual emergency alarm systems for quick identification of health emergencies, which is integrated from the ward to the nurse's station, was designed to allow clinical staff to quickly identify and respond to patient emergencies on the wards, enabling that staff to give life-saving care. This system is available in all wards, including the NICU unit. It should be noted that the medical equipment in that hospital, um, in the Kuwait Children's Hospital in the NICU and the pediatric tower was fit for purpose. Examples of this are vital sign monitors with integrated neonatal and pediatric software, neonatal pediatric ventilators with built-in safety parameter alarms, did we have these at Port of Spain when this thing started to happen? 
well-mounted diagnostic sets with neonatal and pediatric airpieces and neonatal pediatric blood pressure cuffs, syringe pumps with integrated neonatal pediatric parameters, crash carts outfitted with specialized ET tubes for neonatal and pediatric patients, resuscitation units with neonatal child and infant um, face guards to deliver life-saving care. O2 sensors set to neonatal and pediatric. You're hearing these words over and over. It was indeed a children's hospital. Sensors to set to neonatal and pediatric parameters. Incubators with built-in neonatal software and monitoring parameters. Critical care beds were specifically de designed for child care and cots were designed with infection control measures. Each piece of equipment in that hospital in the pediatric and neonatal wards was designed with integrated software features, parameters and alarms to monitor and provide life-saving treatment to neonatal and pediatric patients. So as I close, I again use today and this opportunity, and thank you all for being with us, to do the following. Members of the media, I'm saying, this was the children's hospital that we left. And had this government opened it on time, many, many, many lives would have been saved up to today or many years later. It would have most certainly prevented the horrendous, scandalous tragedy of 11 newborn babes. I am today calling on the Rowley government to put country first and immediately open the Coover Children's Hospital. Open the hospital now. It was intended to be for children, yes, teaching hospital as well, because once you're working in a hospital, it's also a teaching hospital. That was always part of the plan. So to rename it, the Coover, multi-training, multi whatever, whatever, all these name changes have been absolutely nothing. It was a children's hospital, specialized equipment, everything specialized for babies, newborn, and for children, pediatrics. Also for women, part of it was the woman who would come in to give birth. So be this. It is a children's hospital first and foremost. This will most, most certainly reduce the limited NICUs in our country. It will be a major help in preventing further tragic deaths of newborn babes. There is no excuse that the government can now make to continue to delay the opening of that hospital. The Prime Minister must do this now to prevent further deaths of our innocent children. If he has one grain of humanity and conscience within him, open that hospital. As I close, I want to share with you, I hold in my hands, something that we had used um, at that hospital. All the children who came were given one of these, a little teddy, dressed as a doctor. We handed it out to all the children there and they were so happy. Now we have replaced this with something else. At that opening ceremony in 2015, I remember the smiling faces of those children, their joy, their hope, and their light. Today, as I hold this steady up and bear it up, I think about the fact that just a decade ago, that hospital represented and this steady represented the hope and future of our children. Now today, under this rowdy regime of terror, the government from hell, teddy bears are now transformed Sadly to say, it is the corpus, corpses of newborn babes. Teddy bears have been transformed. I cannot, I, I don't think we can even imagine what it is like, what has happened to these mothers. I read one article where the mother was saying, um, you know, they spend time fixing up the place, you know, they fix up, it's a one room house, they have a five room. They will fix up the little nursery, they'll buy the little teddy bear, they'll have it there. Can you imagine their pain today? when they have lost their children under this wicked government. I recall hearing a saying a long time ago, every time a child is born, it gives us hope that God has not yet given up on mankind. Every time a child is born, it gives us hope that God has not given up on mankind. Today I say under this government, the rowdy government, even the hope of the living is being destroyed and replaced with death and despair. How much more can our country take? I say it is time for citizens to take a stand against them before we plummet forever into the pits of hell. It is time for the Rowley government to be fired. I thank you all very much and we'll be happy to take any of your questions. <laughs>
Okay. Well, that's nice. How do they contact with the affected Um Not personally, but we have had persons reaching out, and of course our lawyers are working with the various families uh, to take forward whatever, um, whatever actions may be needed. Yes, true, our lawyers, definitely, we've reached out. I can do that. I can. The reason why I ask is because you were pretty prominently mm -hmm. uh, through the medical social department mm -hmm. units. Yes. Um, so I wanted to find out if you've heard whether that has not been working for them, which is why you're renewing a call. I am certainly renewing that call. I think they need very intensive counseling, and that is the duty right, of the government. Through wherever we can get it, um, Tim and uh, um, Dr. Bodo can probably guide us on which unit or wh where, but the point is, the fact is they should get that counseling. Okay, very intensive counseling on top of that. Uh, well, we've been given some sort of assurance from mm -hmm. the MWRG that they've gone through the necessary um, sanitization methods and so mm -hmm. forth, so it has been to a real run. Do you think at this point, uh, you know, the major should be shut down at least until the probe is uh, I cannot say that whether they should close it down, but I don't trust this government and I don't trust their operatives. So even though they've told us they've done the sanitation, why didn't they, when one died, two died, three died, why didn't you do something? Until, he, until you reach number 11, and who knows how many more. I don't trust them. I do not trust them. And we call for these reports to be made public. So one thing for them, yes, we've done everything. I don't believe them. That, those things should have happened even before the second, and third, and the fourth died. So I do not believe them. I don't trust them. I think they need to do something further. It's not that they've cleaned up there. It's just open that hospital. Everything to deal with the neonates and the children, every single thing is there. You just know, open it. What has happened to the staff of Cook Run? I saw an answer from the mm -hmm. uh, health minister while you were yeah. having yeah. up that conference. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. I was referred to the NCRH. You could give this to. Yeah. I'm sorry? I'm asking if you have any idea what has happened to that Cook Run from lockdown. Well, it, it's locked down. We can't see it. I don't know what has happened. I don't know what has happened. I, I am not aware that any effort has been made to, to empty that hospital or to remove the equipment. I pray God that that equipment is still there so we can open that hospital, multi-million dollar pieces of equipment in that hospital. So it's really sad, Gil. It's really sad. Do you trust the point of your uh, distrust in the government mm -hmm. and their handling of this entire situation, but what about uh, the move to have PAHO investigate this matter privately? Do you yeah. have faith in that? I, I totally agree that power should be brought in. I said it earlier when I spoke. Yes, the answer is yes. I do believe it should be in, become involved. So we will have world standards in what is happening. What I'm saying is we should not await power to do the probe because that takes time for all the protocols to be established. Again, our lawyers will determine that. If you talk about monetary compensation, so I call for counseling and monetary, our lawyers will work on determining, not just waiting to get a courthouse. I'm calling for the government to consider it now uh, in terms of helping these suffering families. So our lawyers, again, are working with the families to see how best they can be assisted. And after this probe mm -hmm. uh, by Pahu, what, what do you hope will come out of it? <laughs> because, I mean... Nothing good will come out of it. No, 11 babies have already died. And on the converse, something good may come out of it that we may be able to put in the protocols and the recommendations to prevent a tragedy like this happening again. You know, this happened in 2018 already, you know, under the same Minister of Health. In 2018, there were several uh, um, babies who died, neonates who died, several. And they didn't learn from that experience, and here we are back again. So maybe out of the probe, you know, the recommendations being made. I gave some of my own here based on... Um, of these two experienced doctors, I gave some of my own suggestions that what could have been done, what could be done. And of course, the probe and recommendations, we'll get some more from out of it. He asked for recommendations, but we are prepared to give the recommendations. He's been you prepared to answer them. Them. Yeah. Oh, them. They're both reminding me, um, in 2013, we had prepared a manual from since 2013. But this government, you know, out of spite and malice, anything that came from my government, they, they throw it aside or they don't open it. So this is still there. And I've given you a few recommendations and certain things I said today. 
So there is this Minister of Health report that was prepared under my government in 2013. May 2013, we have this. Okay? Okay, thank you. So yesterday, the NWRHA uh, revealed that uh, the head of the step in the right direction, more heads have to rule. More heads have to rule. It is a step in the right direction. And then you know what happens. We are 70 wonder country. So the stand of this man on leave, and when you blink and you fall asleep, by the next morning he's back on the job, <laughs> and everybody has forgotten. So board? it is a step. I mentioned the board as well. You know, they, they should look at that board was hand, hand appointed, hand picked. And do you want to move on to another topic, or you want to stay on this one? I asked you the question for this well. On this or others? Others. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, The answer is no. I think not. I think uh, the, the performance has been abysmal and uh, a tremendous failure. We are at some of the highest crime rates we've ever seen in our country happening. So I don't agree. But there is a bill that is going to be debated shortly, or oh, Parliament has started. There is a bill where the government is attempting to, to say that if we have to put a commissioner of police to act, then the government will not come to Parliament to get the approval of Parliament. We, it, it's just a special majority bill, and the opposition, we have already decided in our caucus on when was it? Wednesday. We will not support that. They need our votes, but we will not support it. The reason that came into the law in 2006, that provision, that even an acting appointment must come to the parliament for approval. Okay? There's a reason. It is for transparency. It is for accountability. Because what was happening then in 2006, I worked on that piece of law. Yeah? I was a part of the panel team. And Mr. Manning had a team, and we worked on that 2006 piece of legislation. So I'm very familiar with the background. First of all, you were getting positions where people were acting in positions for long, long, long. So before we put that, that you must come to the parliament, people put acting, you didn't know it maybe a week after you find out who is acting or not acting. And then they end up supposed to act for six days. They say, a man or a woman going off on leave, and they should just act for a few days. Before you check it out, there's a year past, two years past, and you're still acting some great actors we had in those days. So we put in this piece of law to say you must get parliamentary approval. That's one part of it. Uh, I'm saying long-acting persons staying there for very long. But the other one is transparency and accountability. They could then choose anybody, any officer. There are three things in this piece of amendment they brought. That's one of it to remove this accountability to the parliament. Another part of it they're saying the law already has... Um, that the senior officer, the most senior officer, will be the one to act. They've removed that point. So you could take junior PC, whoever he is, <laughs> and put them to act as a commissioner, WPC, WPC, to act as a commissioner of police or a deputy commissioner of police. So we can't agree to that. And the transparency and accountability, they could pick up somebody like a person who was involved in the abduction of a man named Brent Thomas, a citizen, our citizen abducted him. He was in a hotel room in Barbados. And he was there to go and get um, a card, cardiac medical, 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 medical heart checkup. Mm -hmm. They grabbed this man in the middle and I pushed him in, a, in the back of a van, rustled up a plane, dropped him in the plane and bring him home. And there was nothing against the man. There was nothing for that to happen. So the one officer who was recently promoted to DCP, if we don't do this uh, parliamentary um, process, they could pick up that person and put them to become the acting commissioner of police. Tying it back to your point that the commissioner still is coming to an end. And they want to put someone to act. So we cannot say yes to that piece of amendment. And no, I said no, I don't agree that the person should be given back. Now their, 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 their problem is they don't like parliament and they don't like transparency and accountability. And they said, oh, so every time if a man falls sick for two days, you had to come for an acting appointment. Oh, and we had to come back next week because Keith and going abroad. So he's taking over. Every time. So what's wrong? What's wrong with that? Come to Parliament. You have every day of the week to bring it to Parliament, have the accountability, the transparency, and be ensured that somebody is not acting there for the next five years. And we don't know. Do it. So the, the excuse is, look, hey, we can't come every time when somebody falls ill. Yes, you can. That is the law. And we will keep that piece of law on our Saturday books. Yeah, if we have to go out on Saturday to, to, um, to do the, uh, or Sunday for transparency with respect to giving an acting commissioner or acting deputy. So on that issue, 
We are very, very strong. Very strong. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I really don't. That's why we needed to come to Parliament. The um, Police Service Commission prepares a merit list. And you know what happened with that. The man went and grabbed the merit list, merit list from, back, from the president. I mean, what, how much more can they corrupt a democracy and interfere with independent institutions? You find yourself a president who at the same time blissy are there to grab back that list to prevent someone whom the PSC had recommended, you know, bring it to parliament to get approval. I don't know what else you want to ask me, but there's something as I would like to say on a matter raised by the Prime Minister yesterday. So I don't know if you want to ask me anything about that. Well, on the note of the Prime Minister mm -hmm. and uh, the, on the note of the Prime as well, I want to find out if the opposition is going to make another attempt to meet with the government on the current situation. What, what is the plan? I think the days for that was fast. I have no faith, no trust, confidence, no trust or time. I remember Mr. Rowley coming to the end of our two when he said, we will isolate the opposition. We will not cooperate with the opposition. That's what he said. Well, today I see the same. We will not depend on them. Been there on that. Not again. Final question mm -hmm. on the uh, party's uh, internal mm -hmm. situation. Um, yeah. Are you confident heading into a uh, general election with not only uh, your role as the political leader, but Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it widening, by the way. I wouldn't use that word, but you're seeing persons who are expressing different views. Look, ma'am, those are internal party matters, and they'll be dealt with internally by the party. Have you to I still have I started to do what? Have you started to address those matters internally? The party has a constitution. We always act in accordance with the party's constitution. The arms of the party are functioning. We had an attics meeting on. Wednesday. on Wednesday and other parliamentary caucuses and so on. Party will deal with internal matters. And if you tell me that, you know, I wonder if you recall um, a lady by the name of Karen Teixeira, Nunes. You remember she took my, uh, Mr. Rowley to court because of internal elections, you know. So it's not the first time in political parties you have these things happening. It will not be the last time. And we will act in accordance with the constitution of our party and the democracy in our party. It doesn't matter, so we'll be dealt with sooner than later. Am I concerned about going into the election because a few persons have expressed a different view? And the last time I checked, we are still a democratic republic, and everybody has freedom of speech. It is only when we became defamatory or they started to defame you, then you worry and take them to court. But there's freedom of speech, and they are free to voice their opinions, as others are voicing different opinions from them. So I'm, I'm not worried. Um, I, I say I've seen it in every political party over decades. Dr. Megu is a political, whatever, <laughs> political analyst, political um, historian, yes. Happens, it happens all the time. We are not, I don't think we are worried at all about that, but we will do what we have to do in terms of uh, abiding with our party's constitution. Is that all? Anything? Well, I want to make a further statement. I think it's important. I hadn't planned to do it because I've already spoken for so long, but I think it's a very important point. Yesterday, the Prime Minister talked about his travels, and of course, usual blame game, blame Kamala, blame the partnership, blame all of us, and um, who travel more and who travel less. That's not the issue. What he tried to justify his travels is with an imaginary $17, $18 billion. He said because of his travels, $17 or $18 billion came back to this country. Really, Mr. Rowley? Really? Because of those travels? When you went up to Houston, what happened with the gas price that you negotiated? What happened? Shut down so many plants in our country. Seven. 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 So this, this imaginary 16, 17 billion. So why then did you just earlier this year borrow $10 million, come to Parliament to borrow 10, if you bring home 17 billion? You hear that lie? That is a lie. This is an emerging number he pulled out of a hat that his travels brought him 17 billion. Let me ask him this. Is our country broke? Have we run out of money, Mr. Rowley? Or Dr. Rowley, have we run? Is the country broke? Is that why government cannot pay its bills or to suppliers, contractors, and battery funds and so on? Now, the government for this fiscal year, budgeted fiscal year 2024, they pegged natural gas prices at U.S. $5 per mm BTU. That was very important because they have no other revenue stream, no other revenue stream. So the only revenue they're getting is from the energy sector. They said we are going to get it at $5 U.S. per mm BTU. 
What's the reality? What is the truth? From that budget, October 2023, $2.98 was the price. What did they peg it at? $5 US. They're getting $2.98. November 2023, $2.71. December 23, $2.52. Anything reaching near to $5? No. January 24, $3.18. February 24, $1.72. March 24, $1.49. And we come to April, currently averaging between $1.60 and $1.80. Nowhere anywhere near to the $5 that they pegged their hat, to hang their hat up onto $5. So the average price of the gas between October budget and now is US $2.40. Less than half of the budgeted figure of $5. And let's move along with that. Less than half that was projected. When we put this and couple it together with decline in production, I guarantee that the government will in no way meet their target for revenue. Oil production is also at a historical low, comparable way back to 1939 levels. This is your one source of revenue. Down to 1939. The national, national natural gas prices for the rest of 24, as I say, is projected to be U.S. 220, and for next year 25 to average U.S. 290, nowhere near to this five dollars. So these were prices for the coldest months of the year in, in the northern hemisphere. We are now entering hot summer months in the U.S. and Europe, so prices will further drop. They don't need it as much. I say warning to all suppliers of goods and services to the government, to contractors, to persons waiting on VAT refunds and wage settlements. Be very careful with how you are spending your money. This government is broke. They are refinancing and borrowing at high rates. Every time you come to the parliament to increase the borrowing ceiling and the amounts and so on. Because of their mismanagement and failed energy negotiations, government cannot pay its debts. This is why they are forcing through the property tax, utility rate increases, fuel price increases, and so on. So there is no imaginary 17 or 18 billion dollars that Rowley is speaking about. We have not seen this money in any of our budget statements. What we see is negative foreign direct investment. Since 2015, we have seen GDP down by 20% since 2015. We've seen a reduction in foreign reserves when we were there from U.S. $11.5 billion. Where is it now? U.S. 5.5. 5.5. Everything has fallen. Everything has dropped. And you want to tell me you bring this imaginary $17 billion. That's not true, Mr. Rowley. I'm very sorry. And if you did, come and show me where. Put it in the estimates of revenue and expenditure and show us where this came because it's not there in any. What's based on our project, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, has plummeted. You know what did our report is reported that it is now minus. Where we had billions coming in from foreign direct investment like Mitsubishi and whoever else, we now have what? Minus. In other words, the opposite has happened is negative. There's capital flight, there's fleeing the country, they're not coming here. So where this imaginary seventeen and eighteen billion coming from? Nowhere. We are having PNM affiliated people coming to us asking for help because they're not getting paid by the government. A lot of people are not being paid. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance must come clean and tell the country what is the current revenue earned for fiscal 24 compared to what was projected from the energy sector. The country is broke, I'm telling you that. I am calling all citizens, be very judicious with your spending. The little that you have, you, will have, you, you need that to save some of it for something. I am putting country on notice the government does not have the money to pay you if you supply goods, service and goods and services. Get your money up front. Don't let them say, I'll pay you. I'll pay you down the road because they're still owing. So many contractors are being owed and suppliers. Don't be fooled. Um, how can we fix this? How can you fix the revenue streams? The rowdy government has to go. They have to go, and we can fix it. We can decrease crime to encourage more investment locally. We can work with the foreign multinationals to incentivize investment in the energy sector. We can reintroduce original procurement regulations, which the PNM and independent centers gutted, whereby we could save between 2 and $7 billion annually 
that goes into corruption. But they watered down, they gutted that procurement law, and the, the procurement regulator told this country, we lose between two and seven billion dollars each year from corruption. We can also deregulate the banking sector. Too many onerous requirements in the banking industry. You cannot even open an account easily. And uh, uh, recently we had calls to change, um, to add a name to our account. And that has taken us about six months just to add a signatory to an account. Too many onerous requirements. Again, tying up businesses and the ease of doing business. Yeah, uh, damaging the ease of doing business. So I say even to transfer your own money, you want to make papers, you want to access a loan, the requirements are overbearing and stifling. I warned the country that this would happen in previous debates regarding financial bills in Parliament. Many of the same people complaining now were the same ones who supported the PNM to push through these very, very anti-business bills in the Parliament. So again, Mr. Rawley, show us where the 17, 18 imaginary billion dollars that you've brought back to this country, where it come from. Show us where it is. Because if you had done that, you didn't have to borrow year after year. The borrowings in the parliament and extending those um, rates up. Any others? No, poor you, you get all the questions today. <laughs> <laughs> or lucky you, maybe. <laughs> okay. But the others are listening, and I'm sure they will, they will take your questions and deal with them. Is there anything else? Anybody else wants to, to raise? I want to thank you for your time. And have a very blessed safety. Thank you.